All right, today we're going to talk about improper integrals. So what are improper integrals? Well, there are two main types of them. Uh, the first type is the type where you're integrating over an infinite interval. So you have an intimate, infinite domain of integration. So perhaps we want to find the area under a curve that does something like this, where it just juts up and then it just kind of goes on forever and approaches the x-axis, but never quite actually touches it. So to calculate this, you'd have to start your integral here. And let's say that this is called function f of x. And so the area under this curve would be the integral from a of our function f of x. But you'd have to let that upper limit of integration go off to infinity. So you've got an infinite domain of integration. Um, discontinuous integrands. Here, uh, typically, oftentimes, it's not always an infinite range, but it's any type of a discontinuous integrand. So what might that look like? Well, you might have a function that does something like this. Uh, maybe there's a vertical asymptote here, and the function goes up like that. And you're interested in to integrate this function from A to B. And there's a problem because you've got that vertical asymptote and it's not defined there. And we'll see how to address this later, but that's, that's an example. Another type of discontinuous integrand might be something where uh, perhaps your function comes to a cusp and then it's not differentiable at this point here. Let's call this point uh, C for lack of a better name. And that presents us with a challenge as well. So we'll see how to deal with these types of integrals for the rest of this lecture. So the first type we'll explore is the first type where we've got integrating over an infinite interval or over an infinite domain. So typically they're gonna look like uh, something like the picture there, or and then oftentimes they'll have down here, your integrals will have an infinite limit of integration or maybe even two. Uh, so the second type, uh, well, just to look at it before we do some examples is discontinuous integrands. Oftentimes these are vertical asymptotes. Um, which is an infinite range problem. Uh, and typically the way you deal with these is you have to identify the problem first using algebra and then confirm it with a graph. So for our example here, you know, you no know division by zero, golden rule of math. And so the denominator of our expression one over the square root of X, the square root over X is not allowed to be zero, square both sides, get X is not allowed to be zero. And that's where you have this black vertical asymptote shown for this function. So yeah, that's an introduction to the two main types. And now we're going to explore the two types more in depth individually. So we'll start off looking at infinite domains. So yeah, this is infinite domains here. And an introductory example here is to find the area under y equals e raised to the negative x over 2 uh, above the x-axis and in the first quadrant. So the image does a good job of describing the area that we're interested in. Now this thing approaches the x-axis, but it never quite touches it. Um, and so is it a, does it, the area converge to a, a number or does it not converge to a number? So first we're gonna answer a simpler question, something we already know how to do. We're gonna find the area under this curve on the interval from zero to five. And so this area integral would give us this. There's our area integral that we're interested in, this sub problem before we answer our infinite problem. And so you, using a u substitution here, we would get uh, e raised to the u power times negative two, and then integrating that negative two e to the u, and then reversing our substitution, we'd have negative two e raised to the negative x over two. And evaluate that expression from five to zero to get 1.8. And so this number here corresponds to this area, this very, very finite area that we can calculate right there. And that seems fairly reasonable. You know, just looks like about one here and add that on, you fill the first one, keep combining all those areas, get something above two square units. So about 1.8 ish sounds reasonable, not above two square units, but below. Uh, so 1.8 sounds pretty reasonable there. So how can we actually answer the question we're after? Well, the question we're actually after is, this. I didn't actually define it last time, but what we want to know is we want to know the area, which is given by the integral of e raised to the negative x over 2. And we want to know first in the first quadrant, so it's going to start at x equals 0, but then it's going to go off to x equals infinity. And we're going to integrate this with respect to x. 
So here's the idea that we're going to apply. We're going to say, okay, why don't we take, you know, we did five earlier, but if we just took an arbitrary um, upper limit there of integration, we could just do the integration using that arbitrary B moving upper limit there and get an expression for area uh, in the first quadrant up to X equals B, which is given by this. So let's have a look at this calculator and just see what we got here. All right, so you, as you can see, if you drag this B, letting this B upper li limit of integration move on, we can drag it all the way out. And if you're seeing in the lower left-hand corner, at nearly five there, there we go. Sure enough, 1.8-ish. All right, so this is that close. I, I rounded it off in the last thing. But as we let this thing go off to 20, notice that area calculation at the bottom, A of B is that inter that result from the integral that we just saw on the last slide being evaluated at different upper limits of integration, different values of B. And as I let this go, you notice it's approaching, 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 getting closer and closer and closer and closer to, it appears to be two. So let's see how we can, uh, that was just to kind of understand the problem, but let's see if we can formally figure that out. As we let B get bigger and bigger and run off to infinity, we get a better and better approximation of the actual area trapped underneath the curve. So this idea of letting B being a moving upper limit of integration is the same as taking the limit as B goes to infinity. So if we slap limit as B goes to infinity out in front of our integral, well, we've seen that the result of this integral is just this expression, which becomes this expression when we evaluate it for B. And so now all that remains to do is to address the limit. And so plugging infinity in, we know that e raised to the infinity, well, infinity divided by two still gets really huge. So e to a huge number makes this entire fraction be two over infinity. And what does two when you divide it by higher and higher and higher powers? Well, that whole fraction approaches zero. We're harnessing some early like calc one skills that we understand that uh, the limit of one over x as x goes to infinity it approaches zero, and that's the skill and prior knowledge that we're capitalizing on here. Okay, so that first part of our expression goes to zero, and we're left just with this two there. And so we see that, hey, the area that we were actually interested in is exactly two. When an improper integral goes to a, a specific number, we say that the improper integral converges to two. So the area trapped underneath this curve all the way out to infinity is exactly two, which is kind of a nice result. All right, so will this always work? Yes and no. And what I mean by that is just because a limit doesn't exist, we still get useful information about it. But let's come back to that. So consider the area under y equals x squared from zero to infinity. All right, so let's just visit a calculator of this and see what we can explore there. All right, so there's a graph of y equals x squared off to infinity. I'm just going to drag this c, this upper limit of integration, kind of off to infinity. And I'm hoping that you're already seeing that, hey, that area doesn't really appear to be bounded. It seems like the area is going to run off to infinity. So let's see what we get when we take this same approach. So letting this upper limit of integration, calling it b. We can then take the limit as b goes to infinity and evaluate the integral in ge general for our b variable. So doing that gives us the result of limit as b goes to infinity of b to the third power over three. And as you plug infinity in, infinity divided by three, infinity to the third power, all any way you slice that, the whole limit is going to go off to infinity. And so that limit goes to infinity. We learned something about it but it doesn't actually converge on a nice specific number. So we say that this improper integral diverges when the limit goes to infinity or does not exist. So the method works, even though we get uh, a little bit of an interesting result with the limit. That's what I mean by yes and no. Okay, so in general, when you're dealing with this type of a problem, when you're dealing with integrating over an infinite domain of integration, 
here's uh, generally what the setup's gonna look like. So f of x is a continuous function on our domain of integration. And if we have the upper limit of integration going off to infinity, well, you're gonna have some kind of a starting point. Number sign is not special, it's just any generic number. So, you know, pretend it's zero. So the integral from zero to infinity of f of x is equal to, again, you're gonna let that, let that kind of moving, if you wanna know the entire area under this curve, you calculate the area up to B, and then you let that B upper limit of integration run off to infinity and take that limit. Similarly, with the lower limit of integration, if something runs off to, say we're interested in the area trapped under this curve from, I don't know, here, negative one off to negative infinity, well, you would set your lower limit of integration, I like to call it A, uh, and let that one run off to negative infinity in the limit. And then if you have something where you have two, both your upper and lower limit of integration are infinite, sometimes you have to break the function up into multiple pieces. So say we have something like this. It looks a little bit like this. And so we're interested in the area trapped underneath this. Well, that's an infinite limit of integration. And so is that. But we could split this right here at you know, x equals zero. So we could split up this in integral and say, hey, for the lower part of it, I'm going to calculate in blue this integral, which I'm going to take my lower limit of integration and call it a, and let it run off to negative infinity. That's going to give me this area. And then I could combine that with, again, say we're splitting this thing at zero, so I'll put zero in for my number. And I could combine that with the right-hand side of the area. And here, we're going to take our upper limit of integration and let that run off to infinity to find that red area on the right. And we'll see an example of this too, but that's just kind of the general summary of how these problems typically look. Okay, our first example is to very similar to the last thing I drew on the page, which is integral from negative infinity to infinity of one over x one plus x squared. So um, you can go ahead and graph this thing in detail and I encourage you to pause the video and actually uh, do it well and fire up a graphing calculator and get a nice picture of this thing. But for now, I'm just gonna give you a quick sketch. So this function looks something like this, sort of like a bell curve there, it runs off to positive negative infinity. And so what we're gonna do is we are gonna split this thing into two integrals at x equals zero. And on the left, since that's going to be an infinite integral of its own, I'm going to use sort of a moving lower limit of integration to calculate this blue area. And then I'm going to move a, use a sort of moving upper limit of integration to calculate the area to the right of the x-axis in red here. So what's that going to look like? That's gonna look like this. This integral is equal to, in blue, well, the integral is from A as our lower limit of integration to zero of one over one plus x squared dx. But we're not done. We want to take the limit and we wanna let that A value run off to negative infinity. That gives us our blue area. To that, we're gonna add our red area which is given by, again, I'm leaving room so I can put my limit in after I get the integral set up. This time we're starting at lower limit of integration zero, our split point, and we're letting it run off to b. Again, the integral of the same function. But in order to let that limit of integration run off, we have to take the limit as b goes to infinity. Um, I haven't said this or written it yet, but I like to use a and b because the general way that we were learned about limit or uh, integration rather, we always use A and generic and for the lower limit of integration and generic B for the upper limit of integration. That's why I like to, to use them in the manner such that I'm used to, if you will. Okay, so we can do this. This is absolutely an integral we can do. In fact, that is the derivative of inverse tangent, arc tangent. So integrating this thing gives us limit as A goes to negative infinity of arc tangent of x evaluated from a to zero. But the limits being applied to this whole 
expression. We're going to do that evaluation of the integral first before we apply the limit. So I like to put a set of parentheses there. Similarly, over here, we're going to have limit, limit as b goes to infinity of arc tangent of x evaluated from 0 to b. OK, let's keep going. Equals limit. I'm going to drop the subscripts on the limit. We'll come back from when we're ready. So this is going to be arc tangent of 0 minus arc tangent of a plus limit of arc tangent of b minus arc tangent of 0. Now, at this point, it's helpful to note that arctangent of 0 goes to 0, and arctangent of 0 goes to 0. So now that we've done the integration and evaluated it for our generic kind of moving limits, or limits of integration, sorry, we're going to, now we're ready to evaluate the limits. So let's get the limit back involved here. For our blue limit here, the left side of our function is as a goes to negative infinity. So we would plug that in and we'd get what happens to arc tangent as it runs off to negative infinity. To that, we're going to add, well, the second limit, x goes to positive infinity. So we're going to add arc tangent. What happens to arc tangent when we let its input run off to positive infinity? And here, a quick graph of tangent and arc tangent, I think, is helpful. Remember that tangent is shaped like this between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 as its asymptotes. And so when you in invert that, you're going to have arc tangent go like this, where it approaches pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, respectively, as it goes to positive and negative infinity, respectively. So we can see from our picture here that as x runs off to negative infinity, arc tangent approaches negative pi over 2. So we get negative, negative pi over 2. Don't forget about that initial first negative is not the same as the, the result of arc tangent, the limit as x goes to infinity. And then arc tangent as its input runs off to positive infinity approaches pi over 2. You got two positive pi over 2s, and you've got pi. All right, and putting together, I think I already said this, sorry, got interrupted. Um, positive pi over two and positive pi over two, two, two pi's, two pi over twos gives us a single pi. So yeah, that's kind of a fun, another fun result.